Welcome back to Beyond the Headline, everyone. I'm so excited you're with us on the show today because I'm here with the co-founder and CEO of Cherish, Eric Grosse. Eric, thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me on. Well, can we start out with the genesis of Cherish? Because you're back with one of your co-founders from the early 2000s. It's a pretty special story. Sure, sure. Well, uh, you know, Cherish, uh, maybe what I should first do is tell you what Cherish is, because some, some of your audience may not know. So we're an online marketplace for design lovers to, uh, to buy and sell and connect with one another. And uh, there's a lot of things that are unique about us. So, so we're, we're curated, first and foremost. So, so all our items are, are screened for quality and for style. Um, we're all um, vintage and pre-owned only. We handle all elements around fulfillment and delivery, which is particularly important in our space, in the delivery space, excuse me, in the furniture space, because uh, so many items are large and bulky and can't go through traditional channels. So, so uh, you know, we also are virtual, so all the inventory is held uh, online um, uh, by, by our sellers. And uh, we also have a really unique uh, make and offer feature that allows sellers and buyers to kind of find that sweet spot price point um, that, that, that both sides are comfortable with. So that's sort of the, the, the company in a, in a nutshell. In terms of its um, genesis or beginning, uh, it really started off with a good old-fashioned furniture fight. <laughs> so between uh, two good friends of mine, uh, Greg and Anna Brockway, uh, who happen to be married to one another, <laughs> and, and they figured out that the, the best resolution to their squabble uh, was a marketplace that didn't exist yet. So, so that uh, mar- a marketplace that made uh, selling and buying uh, quality pre-owned furniture and decor super easy and super fun, and they thought it was a great idea. You know, they shared it with me. Um, I thought it was a great idea um, as well because the needs for sellers and buyers were so um, were so pronounced. But also, uh, furniture and decor is just an enormous category. It's it's moving online um, uh, pretty rapidly right now, and uh, it's. Um, it's also one where buying vintage and pre-owned is just a no-brainer versus buying new. You save so much money, and uh, the items are available right away. So what's not to like? It sounds pretty good to me. Sure. And one of the, the things that I think is so fun about this is you guys started Hot Wired together back in the early 2000s. And Greg yeah. said you raised $75 million, you hired 100 people, and everything was complete and utter chaos. How is Cherish <laughs> different? Well, uh, it's amazing. You know, 15 years or 16 years is a long time, but especially when it comes to sort of uh, um, uh, um, you know, startups in, in, the, in the peninsula, it's, it's like multiple lifetimes. And, and there is there's a, lot difference, a lot of a difference between um, the dynamic on how we started Hotwire and how we started Cherish. Um, you know, one is it's amazing how much more capital efficient businesses are today versus what they were like sort of back in late 99, early 2000 when we started Hotwire. I mean, at Hotwire, we spent millions of dollars on servers, software, um, hosting services. And now when I think about that, we're, we're writing a relatively speaking pretty modest check to Amazon Web Services every month. You know, that's a pretty seismic mm-hmm. change. Um, I think that, that at the end of the day, the cloud is, is just a wonderful, a wonderful um, platform for entrepreneurs. You can be just so much more efficient. Um, also, the, the, whole, um, the whole process towards software development now is so much more nimble you know, with Agile and other approaches. It's so much more flexible um, and so much more efficient you know, versus the old sort of waterfall um, approaches of the past. So what that means is you can get a bunch of stuff done a lot more quickly and make a lot more changes and with a lot fewer people. So, so uh, speed and efficiency um, are, uh, um, are, are two big, big changes of, um, for startups now, which means that young companies now can punch way above their, you know, their, their, their weight you know, versus, versus back, um, back in the prehistoric period when we started, when we started <laughs> Hotwire. <laughs> but there's some, there's some similarities too. Um, uh, you know, talent is also you know, was was job number one you know back then, and it's just as true today. At the end of the day, you're only as good as the people that you can attract to come work with you, and uh, you know that that is uh, just as as um, true today with Cherish as it was um, back in the day with with Hotwire. And how about for you personally? What does it feel like having a company now versus having it then? Sure. Well, I'm in a different life stage you know <laughs> than 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 I was you know back in 
late 99 early 2000s so so uh you know now um, i break up my work day a little bit more so so i'm uh um, i have a, a family a wife and three great kids and uh I want to make sure that I'm spending time with them, you know, typically around dinner time, and then I have a night shift. So, so you know, my work patterns um, may may have changed um, over the years, but uh, the desire is still there. Do you find that the way you work now has made you more productive? Well, I think with experience, it's uh, like anything. The more the more you're at something, the more you know and understand what works and what doesn't. So you can just be that much more efficient and productive, not only with your own time but with your team's time as well. So, so um, uh, you know, Hotwire was was um, uh, really my first go around as an entrepreneur, um, and there were several others um, in our in our boat too. And we had uh, great desire, I think, terrific instincts, wonderful support, but uh, there's there's um, you know, there's nothing there's there's definitely something to be said for for experience. You know, there's uh, I think a lot less um, you know productivity and drama um, now than there than there was um, you know back back uh, back at Hotwire. I'm glad that you bring that up because that's something that it happens at every stage in your career, but especially in the beginning. And Fred Wilson has a great quote about it that mm -hmm. some lessons you just have to learn the hard way. And that's the only way you can learn them really well. What are some yeah. lessons, whether past or present, that have shaped the way that you lead your team today? Sure, sure. Well, I think, um, as I mentioned, you know, the, the first job um, of any leader in any company is just to find the best possible people uh, to, to come and, and work with you and to make that dream a reality. And great people uh, really don't like being micromanaged, you know, don't <laughs> like being told what to do. And, but they, what they do respond to really well um, is you know, a great vision, an exciting vision, um, clear, exciting, um, achievable yet aggressive goals, and uh, the promise for sort of resources and flexibility to help people just get their jobs done. And and uh, I think the more the more you can provide that type of leadership and that type of guidance, um, the more you're going to get out of your team, and the more engaged and happier everyone is going to be. I'm so happy that you said that because one of my favorite things to do when I'm chatting with someone who's had a couple of startups is you know say you know what have you learned about leadership now, and that's always what comes up is that you actually need to detract yourself a little bit so people can do the work that you brought them on. To do, mm -hmm. can you give us a couple of examples of how that comes into play at Cherish? Sure, sure. Well, it's easy to say, um, and it's easy for me to say with you now, but it's hard to do, especially because companies, um, especially in the early stages, go through so many changes, right? So, so um, um, you're doing a lot of work and rolling up your sleeves and getting a lot done when there's just three or four of you, um, you know, a, a small handful when when in the very very beginning. But even a company like Cherish Now, where we have roughly 40 people, you're still doing a ton of work, and it's and it's and uh, um, and then and you know the art of letting go is is uh, um, is something that um, you can only learn through experience because you want to make sure that you're continuing to lead by example, you're continuing to get the important things for the business done, but you're also um, uh, being um, ready and willing. To not just hand over the reins to people when they come on board to take on an important tasks, but you're also supporting them too. So that you, they're giving you, you're giving them the benefit of your experience, uh, um, so that they can, um, you know, take uh, really the the ability and, and the capabilities and the experiences and talents that they have, combine it you know, sort of with with your own with your own vision, which is particularly important to impart when you're a founder, so that that handoff is very is very efficient. So, so the onboarding um, for for, um, for for any company, but particularly for a startup, is is critical. What are some things that you've learned about onboarding that streamline the process? Sure. Well, I think the first thing to do is to be really clear about sort of what the business does, and that's something that's so easy to forget, but um, is is so critical. So, so having um, having making that be clear when a person starts. Um, you know, both in terms of one-on-ones as well as frequent all-hands meetings, where you can reinforce uh, not only you know, the core um, uh, mission and vision behind the business, but all the little things that are sort of happening um, across the company to make that a reality. So, so, so communication is, uh, is 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 critical, and making sure that the basics don't get lost. And when you say basics, what do you mean? Oh, I think um, uh, you know a tremendous amount of clarity around uh, around around a business's mission. So for for Cherish again, 
uh, you know, we really want to create that awesome um, marketplace for design lovers uh, to, to buy and to sell and to connect with one another. And what that means is, is something that we want to make very tactical and very tangible for all parts of our organization so that they're, they're rowing the boat in, in, in one direction. So, so and then the other thing around goals is also really important. I probably shouldn't get into the internal goals that we've established, but I can say it's really important for my team to know them, and, and they do. And how do you, so not the actual goal, but how do you establish them? Um, that's a collaborative process. So, so uh, a lot of it is, is, is working with, um, with your, your broader team, um, understanding sort of what the business is doing really well with and where, and where the opportunities are. It's also, frankly, where, the, where, the, where, um, where we're struggling and where we need to make um, uh, more, um, more, more changes. Um, but also working with um, with your board and and uh, the investor community to make sure that your plans are aligned with with um, uh, the broader picture in terms of how the company operates and and continues. Um, I think another thing that's also really important is to make sure that uh, you're always looking sort of outside, if you will, and not getting too insular. So so looking at the competitive environment, how things are evolving, um, and and um, how the business um, can respond to that. Um, uh, Changes in the marketplace is also something that's that's uh, really critical. So looking outward, um, um, working with the team, working with um, with important constituents like the investor community is is uh, all factors that drive into into nailing a, cl a clear a clear strategy. That's great, and I want to dive into a couple of those areas. So let's say I helicopter in and yep. I'm in a cherished board meeting, and you're talking about something, whatever it is, it's going really well. How do you assess how to make that better? How to make it better? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with expectations, right? So, so, so goals is is um, uh, you know setting aggressive goals. I think is really really important. And when you're surprised by how well you're doing in an area, constantly reassessing and reevaluating sort of what determines and and uh, success means is uh, is a is um is a uh, is an important um, an important capability. So so uh, and and there's nothing more invigorating than a company that's doing well that's raising the bar higher, right? And and uh, trying to understand sort of how high is up. So so I think that that um, never settling and and uh, being able to push on a string, you know, when when it's leading you in a very good direction, oftentimes can not only uh, lead to more results and better results than you ever possibly thought of. But also can lead to a number of other ancillary opportunities that that uh, that also might uh, make a real a real big difference. Whether now at Cherish or in the past at Hotwire when you were leading Expedia, when has been a time that you had an inkling and said, you know, I think we should explore this opportunity. It's going really well, and it turned out to have a great outcome for the business. Sure. Well, I think that that um, um, with with um, with Expedia, for example, um, Expedia is uh, an amazing brand, an amazing company, um, and has a tri a, an amazing um, uh, platform uh, in the business. Um, but was at at one time so large that it was sort of forgetting who its customer was. And and uh, an inkling that I had um, when I stepped into the role was really to make sure that every single person in the organization uh, within Expedia was once again thinking. Like a customer, and and uh, you know that was I think a really um, important development to get people once again putting the traveler first, and and really looking at how the uh, the Expedia platform, the Expedia organization, all the resources that the business had to to um, to bear could really focus on making that experience better. Um, so so to think less about sort of near term. Um, uh, you know, tactical revenue boosting initiatives, and more think about what is going to transform the experience, and and that is um, you know, that mindset and that approach to uh, putting the travel first ended up um, really helping the business uh, reverse market share declines um, in in uh, in the U.S. Uh, grow the business more aggressively um, in Europe, as well as uh, uncover some amazing opportunities in the Asia Pacific region. And when you focus on that, I love the way you said that you need to think like your customer. And that can get lost. And it was something I wanted to explore. You know, what does it feel like to 
run the largest travel platform in the world and not forget about your customers? How are you constantly reinforcing that to the organization? Well, I think one one way to be a um, to, to have a really strong reminder of that is to be a customer yourself um, and constantly using your the service yourself and to always uh, keep that uh, a strong sense of curiosity around around what works and what doesn't. And when you when you know something well and and uh, you you really can can. Uh, uh, Hone in on the on the on the flaws, you know, much more so than I think a um, than a than a typical customer might. So so that is uh, you know that knowledge and insight and dedication towards really act, not just acting like a customer but being a customer <laughs> is really uh, is one one important one important message, and 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 that's from the you know from the from the top on down, and the the I think the other elements are really. Um, uh, again, in a, in a larger organization, and as and as uh, capable an organization as Expedia is, is to respect its size. You know, this is an organization with hundreds, thousands of people um, in you know dozens of offices around the world. So when you have a um, uh, enterprise like that, uh, communication um, and alignment, you know, is not a given, right? So so everything that we were talking about at the outset around sort of mission, goals, um, communication. Um, become especially important when you're talking about a business of that size um, and that scale across so many so across so many geographies. So I spent a lot of time on the road um, during that period. I call it euphemistically my Bedouin period because uh, it seemed like every week I was on a plane going going somewhere. And what was your favorite part of that role? Um, I loved the challenge and I loved the people. Um, there were there were great, talented, um, passionate people that really um, that really wanted to make the business. Uh, uh, great um, across across the globe, and having that kind of um, international platform um, to make a, a difference, literally across dozens of, of, of travel markets around the world, was uh, an incredibly um, invigorating um, experience, and one that one that I remain very grateful for. And as you reflect back now, are there any specific moments that kind of felt like a critical turning point for you? Um. A critical, uh, critical turning point um, professionally. Professionally. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that that when when going through um, uh, you know years of, of experience, um, ultimately um, defining sort of your own leadership style is, I think, um, a really a really important lesson, and it's one that's really a process of self discovery and and making sure that. Um, the leadership style that one develops is one that's true to yourself and very genuine, and and uh, that was a um, a journey you know for me that was one that um, you know took years like I think it does for for most people, and uh, taught me a lot of lessons around sort of around what motivates people, what inspires people, and what can what can um, bring uh, uh, terrific businesses and teams to to to, to greatness. Really glad you said what motivates yeah. people because as a leader, it's always your job to. That's the shift that everyone talks about. You go from actually yeah. working to being more of an inspirational figure. When you're trying to inspire thousands of people across a company and you don't have time anymore to sit down with each of them, what does that look like? Well, I think part of it is just to think of it as one of your most important roles, if not the most important role, is to be that um, motivator in chief. You know, to be that person that people are excited um, to come and work with every day. You know, not only um, as an individual, um, but also to uh, demonstrate sort of that confidence um, as a as a leader in in the business. Um, because I think people really respond to to, uh, to 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 confidence as a from from, from leadership. You know, another another important characteristic of leadership, I think, is really to be a counter a counterbalance, so that um, when things are going fantastically well, um, you're pushing yourself and the organization to think about where the things could be going wrong, and not to allow um, a business to become too um, secure or or uh, or arrogant. You know, and similarly, when there's downtimes, and I've gone through, I'm, we've all gone through a number of down cycles. Is to remember, you know, what what is great about this business? What is what makes it special, and why will it why will um, it move on from its struggles and not just not just continue, but but thrive? And to be that that boost in the arm, 
you know, when the chips are down, I think is 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 really important. That counter that counterbalance um, is a really important characteristic of of, of leadership. Um, you know, I think in, integrity is also one that's that's uh, that's an often used term, but also one that's really really important, um, so that people have every confidence that uh, that a that the, that the leadership of a, of a business will make the right decisions with the business in mind and really thinking about um, its its people. Um, and then the last uh, last element also around leadership that I've um, uh, um, picked up over over time is really the importance of putting others first and giving awesome people um, credit for their accomplishments and to uh, really really not make it about you um, but really make it about um, the people that you're working with that end up you know driving change and making a difference. One of the things you mentioned was the decision making. Eric, how has that yeah. process evolved for you? I know you have a great post about, you know, not making decisions at night and waiting until yeah. the next morning. <laughs> yeah, how has the way you make decisions changed? Well, I think um, one, one, um, one truth, I think, is that people that make, it's who makes the decision. And people that make not just good decisions, but great decisions, or even the best decisions, are usually the one closest to the actual work at hand. Uh, they have the most insight, particularly when you hire well and you have great people. And when, when, when you have smart people that are close to the data, close to the um, strategy of the business, understand the goals, you know, giving them the confidence and the leeway for them to make the decisions um, is really, really important. Um, as long as, and, and it's your job as a leader to provide that construct so that those good decisions are made. In a weird way, I almost think that the more senior you become in an organization, the fewer decisions you make. And, and the, but the decisions that you do make are the really important ones that trickle to all the tactical decisions that people make day in and day out. Can you give us an example of a big decision that you had to make and how you approached it? Sure. Um, are there too many to count? <laughs> oh, there's, there's lots. There's 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 lots. But um, maybe one that that leaps to mind is is um, you were talking about um, short term versus long term, and and uh, I think it's really important, um, especially when stepping into a new role, to really look for the um, what's it going to take for the business to be healthy, sort of, and successful over the long term. And a big part of that is loyalty, right? Is getting people coming back and using your service time and time again. And what are the barriers to that? So, so uh, when I stepped into the Expedia role, there were some shortcuts being taken around um, what I would call kind of almost sugar high, um, you know, um, uh, uh, revenue boosts. You know, that weren't real. They were actually detracting for the from the long term health of the business. Booking um, airline booking fees was is one example, where where um, uh, you know the for a business the size and the scale of Expedia, those booking fees were very material in terms of the total amount, but it was taking away, it was contributing to our market share declines, it was contributing to the dissatisfaction that we were seeing in our surveys, um, and it was also impacting um, our ability to cross-sell other products, because in travel, uh, the trip begins with air, and and, uh, and having a strong airline product can, can drive um, so many other um, uh, opportunities uh, across across a, a trip. So, so the decision to eliminate those fees and forgo that um, uh, the tens of millions of dollars in revenue that came with it was a hard one, but a right one for the for the um, for the for the business because not only did it engender um, uh, uh, in, improved for sort of repeat in loyalty, but it really helped us to focus on what are the things that we need to do at the business that's really going to drive um, constructive um, um, change and 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 loyalty and repeat and strong customer satisfaction. So that's the. That's the part of the business that is is um, is a critical is is a, is a critical mindset that I think founders um, and leaders need to bring is is that long term success um, uh, perspective around what it takes for a business to to succeed. And how does that translate into your role now, looking at the long term, and maybe not right now, but when you guys first started? So let's say like the first two months, every startup, no matter who you are, you're just struggling to make it trying yep. to get to the next day. How do you infuse that same, nope, we have a long-term goal, we're not going to take a shortcut mentality? Sure, sure. Well, I think part of it in a young, for a young business is finding sort of that, that proverbial uh, product market fit. You know, what, what, is, what is working um, that, that customers and can't get enough of and they're going to keep them coming back? And then how do you make that um, 
scalable um, so that uh, the business will will um, ultimately become profitable and and really build an enduring organization that 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 sustains itself over time. And there is you know plenty of companies that are very good at generating revenue but aren't good at ge- at generating businesses. You know I think that that um, a, a really a really important discipline um, for a young company is not just think about growth, but how's that growth going to grow up and become uh, a real, a real scalable organization. I love that you said that. And I was just reading a post in first round review about as your company grows, make sure it doesn't break because there's a lot of things that running an organization with 10 people is different than 30 people. And certainly much different than when you're at Expedia and you're leading thousands As you lay the foundation now for the next couple of years at Cherish, what are some things you're adamant about including? Well, I think that that, uh, what we want to do is is think about what are the elements around Cherish that make us uh, that proverbial first call um, for both sellers and for buyers. So, so it's it's really about delivering an outstanding experience um, and in a category as as uh, as broken as pre-owned furniture and decor, because there's not a lot of compelling alternatives out there. So so uh, for 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 us, it's all about for um, for 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 buyers. You know, the key metric for us is improving conversion, so that more and more items are are purchased, which to us tells us that it's an outstanding um, it's an outstanding service and marketplace for our for our, for our buyers. But it's also delivering what our sellers want, which is which is volume. So, so um, looking at all the different ways in which we can drive and improve conversion is something that is that that myself and the rest of the team are are constantly looking at. And like, and I think a way that we're sure approaching it is looking at here are the things that we can do that are iterative. Uh, to use a baseball analogy, sort of the singles, you know, then the doubles um, that um, that uh, can can make a positive improvement. But then at the same time, looking at more wholesale changes that we can do that might lead to sort of those big um, grand slams, if you will, that will really um, improve, improve the experience. So having that nice balance between um, um, tactical changes and also not being afraid to sort of take bigger swings is, is something that I and the rest of the team um, strive every day to do. Glad that you mentioned taking bigger swings, too, because that's always on the. So as a consumer, I'm thinking, yes, I can't wait to see what's going to happen next and a big risk they're taking. How do you prepare your team internally, though, to take a risk? Well, I think risk is part of growth. And, and, and that's one thing I can say that is very healthy about the Bay Area sort of uh, ecosystem is that failure is not um, treated with scorn. It's uh, treated as um, part of the process towards continuous improvement. And 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 uh, um, f- failure um, is only a failure when you do something wrong and you don't learn from it. So 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 I think that that um, um, that what we do um, and what I do at, at Cherish is 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 to really focus on let's go ahead and step up to the plate and make these changes. Obviously, nothing in life is guaranteed. So let's take a good hard look and make sure that we have the systems in place to ensure that we're tracking how these um, improvements are performing so that we can kind of go through a process of continuous improvement that really focuses on keeping the stuff that works and building on it, but also not being, being afraid to sort of cut the things that don't. So, so, so and that, uh, that culling, you know, um, combined with um, keeping what works is what gets your sort of key metrics going in the right direction and allows you to grow the way you want. Fantastic. And then for you personally, last one, Eric, but just as you step back, whether, you know, it's reflecting on these experience, past experiences, what are you excited to learn now? What, is, what wasn't filled in then that you're eager to explore today? Ah, uh, well, I think that, that uh, I mean, that's the wonderful thing about working um, in a company like Cherish that is really trying to deliver a outstanding new service, you know, for, for, for sellers and buyers alike, and also disrupting the, the industry a little bit and looking at um, new ways of, 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 um, of bringing uh, vintage and pre-owned you know, to, to, uh, to families as well as, as well as sellers. So, so I think maintaining that strong curiosity um, around what are the things that, what are all those things that, that, those, that those two constituencies want is something that I'm, uh, I'm, I still think I'm in the early stages of learning. You know, I spent um, over a dozen years uh, in the travel category, and I was still learning um, with every day um, in year 12 as, as I was in, in year one. And, and, 
I mean, a new category that's also going to, going through a similar um, uh, migration from the offline to online in furniture is is also a, um, a tremendous learning experience for me, and I'm only a year, you know, three into it. So so so, this is a big category where there's a lot to learn, and I think the importance of staying curious. Uh, and, and never thinking that you know too much about uh, what sellers and buyers and key, key constituents want is, uh, is an important part to not only ensuring that a business will be successful, that Cherish will be successful, but that it will be an engaging and fun experience for, for, um, uh, in, in terms of my own development. And, and learning is a, is a lifelong thing, and I'm very excited to be, to be doing that here. And if you could have one question answered about that, learning in the industry what would you want it to be oh let's see um choose wisely i'll bring a fairy godmother right now and just answer it. <laughs> um cheap shipping that's a hard one for you guys i didn't even think of that <laughs> so that's uh yeah that's the the being able to get the um, items from point A to point B is is uh, is a critical part of what we're doing, and we've made a tremendous amount of improvements in that respect in terms of encouraging local um, local deliveries. Um, working with um, an incredible variety of of, um, of fulfillment partners to to uh, to make sure that the the process is is seamless. Um, but you always want those you always want that shipping price to be lower, and and uh, there's there's. Uh, um, you know, that's, that's an exciting, an exciting um, component to tackle. Well, I'll hold you to that, and we'll cover it in our next interview. I can't <laughs> thank you enough, Eric, for taking the time to really go back and illustrate different parts of your journey so vividly. It was tremendously helpful, and I'm excited for everyone to tune in. What's the best way for everyone to stay up to date with you and also come on and check out Cherish? Sure. Well, just uh, uh, C-H-A-I-R-I-S-H dot com. Uh, we have over 75,000 uh, wonderful uh, pre-owned uh, vintage uh, pieces for your perusal. Um, we take care of all the legwork out of getting the item to your door, um, whether it's across uh, town or across the country. So, so please um, uh, um, uh, spruce, up, spruce up your home life and your home and, and uh, um, you know, do Re recreate the home of your dreams um, on, uh, on, a, on, a terrific, on a terrific budget. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Jenna. It was a pleasure speaking with you.